Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Merry Christmas 2022. Our text that I want to look at in this video is in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read three verses now. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Dami. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Saul had been centered in conflict with the uh, Philistines, and now there's a pitch battle. There are many who believe that this is just fiction, uh, but for those of us who know and love the Lord, we know that it is, in fact, actual history. The Philistines had been defeated uh, several times, so they were sort of used to losing. And now they're pitched in a battle against Israel. And either the high command decided to do something or just, or some of the soldiers. We don't really have any idea. But it looks like that it, it was, and, and we're going to try something a, a little different. We're going to send out a hero from our side, and we're going to demand that they send out uh, a hero from theirs, their side, and, you know, this will save a lot of bloodshed. You know, and if our guy wins, well, then Israel will be our servants, and if their guy wins, then we'll be their servants, and so they sent out Goliath. And what in the world does Goliath have to do with Christmas? You ask. You know, his height was between 9 feet 9 and 11 feet 4. I think the most probable estimate is about 10 feet 3. That's pretty big. And with all of his armor and, and all of his military might, he instilled abject fear in the Israelites. This was something new to Israel. You know, they were used to fighting the enemy, and they were kind of used to winning most of the time. And now they had a challenge, and they were afraid to meet it. You know, you got to wonder why. Why didn't Saul go and fight Goliath? I mean, when Saul was chosen to be king of Israel, he was head and shoulders taller than anybody in the crowd. He was obviously a hero when he fought, you know, because the people would sing about his exploits. Why didn't he go fight Goliath? Anyway, nobody volunteered. They were all terrified. Not only that, this went on for 40 days. Every day, Goliath was out there. He was demeaning Israel and challenging everybody to a fight, anybody to a fight. Apparently, if we read the white spaces correctly, you know, there were skirmishes that went on at the same time, but essentially the battle was on hold. Now, you all know that David showed up. He was keeping his father's sheep, youngest of eight kids, you know, his father said, hey, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how the battle's going, but, you know, uh, take a few cheeseburgers out here, you know, to your, to your brothers. And so he did. And when he got there, he heard Goliath demeaning Israel, running the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob down. And he wanted to know what was going on. David said, I'll fight him. And his own brothers, his own brothers demeaned him. They looked down on him. They, they criticized him. But the message got to Saul, 
And he said, you know, I'd really like to talk to that young man. Now, you're commander in chief of the Israeli Army, Navy, and Air, you know, I guess I can't say Air Force, but you're responsible for Israel's welfare. You know, the victory's gonna hang on your decisions. And, and, and you look at a kid, 16 to 20, couldn't have been much older than that. You know, he wasn't as tall as any of his brothers. And so you suggest to him that he doesn't have a chance. You can't do this, is what he tells David. And David says, well, I can. I can do it. I can do it with the power of the Lord. Now, I don't have any ability to tell you why Saul agreed to let him do it. There's no way Saul would have ever made it. And of course, we see the sovereignty of God. We see the, ab the supreme sovereignty of our God in that. Somehow or, or another, Saul decided to let him go. Offered David his armor. His armor was way too big. Uh, Saul was a big man. And David said, I can't use this. And Saul still let him go. Now the head of the army is letting an unarmed kid go fight this giant bully, you know, fully armed, nine foot something giant, and nobody can explain that separate from the sovereignty of the Almighty God. And you all know what happened. You know, he chose up, chose some stones. Uh, you know, there's some who like to say that he chose five stones because Goliath had, had five brothers. I, you know, but, but I'm not sure. But that's that's not the point. The point is he chose some nice round stones that would fly good, and he killed him. And you all know the story. Keep in mind that Christ is our rock. You know, and I could spend the entire evening here pointing out to you the applications that you can make of this particular situation. However, I've told you all this to say one thing. Nobody could believe that Goliath was dead. And Saul's response was, whose son is, is this? Whose son is he? And I've spent much of your time here, you know, for that one question. That, that, that question occurs one more time in your Bible, only once. And it occurs, it's fat, you can find it in the context of our Lord Jesus Christ and his conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees. One of the Pharisees, who, who was a lawyer, he asked him, you know, what, the, what, was, what was the greatest commandment? You know, he was going to trip him up. And Christ, of course, quoted, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, with all thy strength, and, and thy neighbor as thyself. And all the law, all of the law, and the commandment hangs on that. Have you ever thought of the fact that it'd be very difficult to steal your 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 neighbor's chickens if you loved him? You know, it'd be really, really difficult to go on and punch your neighbor in the jaw, you know, if you loved him. It'd be very difficult to gossip against your friends if you loved them. All the law hangs on that and the Pharisees had to agree. Well, you've answered correctly. So since they had asked him a question, he thought, well, he'll ask them a simple question. What do you think of Christ? Whose son is he? The only other time that that question is ever asked. And that question, dearly beloved, is important for us this Christmas season and throughout the rest of the year. Whose son is he? The Pharisees, skilled in the scriptures, they immediately answered, the son of David. He's the son of David. Our Lord never made up scripture. You know, one of the wonderful things to me is, is how our Lord carefully handled the word of God. He didn't believe in 
in two or three Isaiahs. You know, he quoted passages from the early chapters of Isaiah and from the later chapters of Isaiah, knowing confidently that they were Isaiah's prophecies. And when questions were come to him, he would answer, what saith the scriptures? Have you read the scriptures? Ye search the scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. And so he answered with scripture. If that's the case, if, if he is the son of David, how is it then that David in the 110th Psalm said, The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make mine enemies thy footstool. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Clearly, the Lord Jesus Christ is identifying the Lord in Psalm 110 verse 1 as the Messiah, the Christ. No argument from the Pharisees. They couldn't answer. Not one answer could they bring against him. Not one accusation could they bring against him. The problem with Christmas, dearly beloved, is that we violate that simple question. Whose son is he? A baby born in a nondescript situation the scriptures don't see him as a baby. The shepherds came and saw him as the Messiah and they, and they praised God. Wise men from the east saw him as, as the king of the Jews. It's only Christians who have somehow tried to make something out of the birthday of the baby. And all we see is a baby in a manger. We argue about whether there ought to be a manger scene or not. Turn with me, if you would, to the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 1, For the law is only a shadow of the good things to come, not the realities themselves. Dearly beloved, that's Christmas. It can never, by the same sacrifices offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Couldn't do it. They had a day of atonement. But as soon as that day was over, on the way home, they knew that they were going to sin, and there had to be another day of atonement. And another. And another. Verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. And dearly beloved, that is what you ought to have this Christmas. No more conscience of sins. If you carry conscious guilt of sin, you might as well say Christ did not do enough. Lo, I, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. What was that? What was that will? A will to die. This isn't some cute babe in a manger where we can now give gifts to one another. No. I'm, and folks, I am not opposed to Christmas gifts or nativity scenes or Christmas trees or any of that. Yes, God did give us the gift of deliverance, but dearly beloved, redemption was not a gift. It was the payment of a debt, a price. It was the payment of a price. I come to do thy will, and that will was to die. Come Easter, there'll be a thousand sermons preached that Christ exhibited his humanity when he prayed to be delivered from the cross. No such prayer. If he ever prayed that, then, dearly beloved, he prayed something that he knew was not God's will. And our Lord became a sinner. 
that baby born in that manger is worshiped because he died in our place that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And it is astounding to me how many Christians I talk to who have great remembrance of sin. Oh, Pastor Steve, you just don't know what I did. I don't care. I don't care to know. Yeah, well, do you think a murderer could would go to heaven? Well, you mean like David? Are you a murderer? So was David. Are you an adulterer? So was David. Are you a blasphemer? So was Paul. The problem, dearly beloved, is if you have a conscious guilt of sin, you are saying that Jesus Christ did not do enough. You know, wonderful how he redeemed others. But, but my sin's greater than anyone else's. Come on. There would be no conscious guilt of sin. It wasn't possible that the blood of bulls and goats would take away sin. Dearly beloved, do you realize that the Messiah could not come to reign unless he died? Why didn't Israel see that? That that, that coming Messiah reigning on the throne of David. And, and I believe that that throne of David is at Jerusalem, not in heaven. And that's where he's going to reign. That, that he couldn't reign unless he died. How'd they miss that? It took the substitutionary, the vicarious death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for God to say, you are my children. You can argue that being the sovereign God, he, he could have just dismissed your sin. Folks, had he done that, he would not be righteous. Oh, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Folks, it is not about our will. It's not about our strength, our armor, our Goliath, our sacrifices. Because in burnt offerings and sacrifices, he had no pleasure. Well, why, didn't, why were they then given in the Old Testament? And why did, why did he have no pleasure in them? He commanded them because, dearly beloved, every one of them looked forward to the death of his son. And that birth at Bethlehem of Judea looked forward to the death of his son. Our text in Hebrews reads, above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for and only once by this offering, he has perfected forever those whom he set apart. That is Christmas. In order for the almighty eternal God to die in your place, he had to be born. You can rejoice today that you stand before God without spot and without blemish. Because the Lord Jesus Christ was willing to become man and die in your place. I don't talk much about my personal life, but I tell you the truth when I say that my hearing someone say many years ago, many years ago, seven words as we were walking alongside each other. God became man and dwelt among us. 
Those words were the only words to this day anyone ever spoke to me that caused me to literally stop dead in my tracks and acknowledge for the first time that Christ loved me. And he loved me enough to die in my place. And to me, folks, that's Christmas. That's Christmas. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful holiday. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.